Hey there, Duke fans. This is episode number 619 of the Duke Basketball Roundup, and this is going to be the one that most of you are probably going to turn off because it, it's, it's the sad one. It's the last one of the 2023-2024 season. Of course, Duke loses 76-64 to to NC State in the Elite Eight on Sunday night. It's our job to talk about it, so we're here to talk about it. I am Donald Wine. I'm your host for this episode. I am here, as always, with Jason Evans. Jason, uh, first off, thoughts about last night, just how you're feeling today. I know we've had about 15 hours to kind of digest that that we don't have to, we don't have any more basketball to watch, unfortunately. Yeah, it sucks. It's you know, I've had I've had a bunch of folks, like friends, Duke fans, uh, even family saying, Oh, are you okay? Um, yeah. <laughs> I've been a been a Duke fan for 40, 40 years now. Um, and I've been unbelievably blessed in those 40 years to have five of those years end with a victory. Actually, technically it's seven of those years because <laughs> in COVID year of 2020, Duke mm-hmm. won a game and then they canceled everything. And then in 2021, we won the game we against ended Louisville with the- in the ACC tournament. Yep. And then we had a COVID test and we were out. So technically it's seven, but but really in five of those years, Duke has ended the season with a victory. Well, that's, that's like what? 12%, something like that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> A little more than 10% of the time, we end with this frustration and sadness. And and by the way, we're the most blessed program around. Like in my, in my 40 years, it's unbelievable that we've won a national title five times, that we've ended the season on a happy note as often as we have. Uh, you know, there are great, great programs who would kill for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yes, of course, I'm fine. We're all fine. It's sad that the journey with any team is over, but like people who are like, are you okay? I'm a little bit like, yeah, I mean, yes, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. I echo that. Right. It, 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 it's, it sucks, frankly, that the season's over and we got so close to the final four and, and came up just short. Also, I will say at this point, like congratulations to the women's team. Like they got to the sweet 16. They had a hell of a comeback against UConn. They, they almost, were able to make it to the Elite Eight. Thankfully, Jason, maybe they didn't because Portland's having some issues with their with their basketball court. Um, how, they had to deal oh, with that. How awful is that? The, the NCAA, women's game. NCAA needs imagine? to fix that. That's 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 that's, that's just... a problem. You can't have that. Uh, and, and that just also you know just highlights the disparity in resources and just attention and just care that the NCAA has between the men's tournament and the women's tournament. That wouldn't happen on the men's side. It should never have happened on the women's side. But I digress. I think. Uh, when we talk about the tournament and just and just some basketball in general, this is the rough time. And I hate that we have to do these almost every single year. We, of course, we want to you know win the last game of the season and hoist the trophy. But as Jason, as you mentioned, that doesn't always happen. So here we are. I will say this, Jason, for everyone out there who's asking, hey, what's up with the rest of the team? Who's going to be leaving? Who's going to be staying? This is not the podcast for that. This is not the episode no. we have the rest of the offseason to talk about who stays, who goes. And of course, as we get news, we will bring that to you and we will discuss it here. But until then, let's talk about the game that happened last night in Dallas against NC State. Again, 76-64 is the final score. And Jason, we begin with the headlines and and we got a ton. Uh, it wasn't as many as the Houston game. Of course, a lot of people uh, got a loss. I will say before you get to the headlines, we got a lot of people who said, uh, you know, Gave us some well wishes and and thanks for uh, just providing this content over the season. We really appreciate that. That like that I know in in the rough moments that it was after the loss, it was nice to read those emails. So we appreciate uh, all of you who sent in uh, sent in emails that said just simply thank you, not just to us but to this team because it was a fun season to watch overall. Yeah, and by the way, for all those thanks, the end of the season doesn't mean that our job is done. <laughs> right. Right. Donald and I are not finished. Uh, we hope that you all will not stop listening. We'll hope you will continue to send us your thoughts and comments. I want everyone to know that we read every single one of them. It's just that it's a lot to respond with a thanks or I agree, or more often than not, I want to respond with like longer stuff. And I'm like, I don't have time mm-hmm. for all of this, but I want people to know they are every single one of them are being read. And we really appreciate all the all the comments from all of you. It is 
Never, Donald, in my wildest dreams did I imagine that this podcast, when we started this in in 2015, never did I imagine that it would become what it's become in terms of the number of people who listen to this, the number of folks who surprise me by telling me that they are fans of the podcast when I'm like, you know more about the program than I do. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's it is a it is a real, real pleasure. And we love getting everything in that inbox at dbrpodcast at gmail.com. I do want to comment about one thing though, really quickly. Uh, we we got folks yesterday sending us headlines in the pregame, at halftime, early in the second half. Look, I get it if there's like two minutes left and the and the game is really over, but a, a headline really should be about what you observed in the game and how the game went, not just a random feat of alliteration. I mean, congratulations for those, and they're they're great, but it. The headlines that really had nothing to do with the actual contest or people who rushed to judgment too early in the such, I'm not going to say I delete them immediately, but I kind of delete them immediately <laughs> if you get my drift. I'm just saying I, uh, I I appreciate at least the more considered takes versus the ones that come in really, really, really early. I think the the issue is that yesterday we got quite a few. It wasn't just like one or two that we can kind of go, oh, yeah, that's that's funny or whatever and kind of laugh at it afterwards this we i think we got like 15 before yeah. halftime so it wasn't like a, a you know people trying to reverse jinx or anything like that it was more of a, a we 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 try to be as thoughtful in our approach to this and, and we hope that the headlines also reflect uh that that thoughtful approach to what we saw uh, on the basketball court whether you were in person or, or watching on tv like like jason and i were so um, so yeah, I will leave it at that, that Jason. All right. So let's get to the headlines now. Cause I was the guy this time tasked with reading through all of them. And even though it was not the 54 that we had in the wake of the Houston game, I think it was around 40 or so. Uh, Chris Berry got this one. Duke lays an egg on Easter in elite eight beat down by NC state. I like the little Easter reference there. Jared Strauss. I love this one. <laughs> I'm going to laugh in advance of reading it. Front of the rim considers lawsuit as Duke hits it over and over again. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't like that one, Jared, but I like that one. You, uh, you, you understand yeah. what I'm saying here. Duke had tired legs in this contest, and the front of the rim was being assaulted by the Blue Devils again and again. Tina L. She didn't provide her full last name, but Tina L. gave us Duke not as hungry like the Wolf Pack. Little Duran Duran reference there. I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick Soprano. Uh, and, and this is another one. So we had Duran Duran. Here's a little usher for you. DJ got us fallen out of the tourney. <laughs> um, I thought he was going to let it burn, but he didn't. So another, yeah. another usher reference. That's another, right. Uh, Nate Damon gave us heavyweight title fight up next. Zach Eady versus Snack Eady. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm like, Zach Eady versus Snack Eady. That is really funny. That, so that Nate, yeah, <laughs> man, Nate, way to go, buddy. Corbin Vandewedge, Mike dropped first half poise, drowned out in second half noise. Once DJ is in the house, very clever. And then, come on, you knew I had to do it. Courtney Kruger gave us another limerick. Mm -hmm. Here's Courtney's. There once was a lad named DJ to Dallas, he came to play. Duke could not hit, and that was it. It hurts to lose that way. I mean, it's a loss, but man, Courtney just brought the heat. It, it we're going to talk about it a little bit in the bad, obviously, but uh, I think people might be might be asking the question, Jason. Unfortunately, which DJ are they talking about? Because there was multiple DJs spinning sets uh, for NC State yesterday, and this is they true. both were great. They both were stellar. Um, before we do that, let's get into what was good about this game. And Jason, I'm going to start with Jared McCain because once again, he came in, he played every single second of this game, uh, just like he did against Houston, had 32 points. He was the only guy to hit a three and he hit five of them. And, and on top of that, one assist, one steal, one block on offense. When we needed a spark, there was a lot of guys who, you know, we, as you mentioned, we kept hitting the front of the rim and it kept getting frustrating. But one guy who felt like was punching through on on occasions was Jeremy McCain and, and the, the fact that he was able to 
end up with 32 points. I know he hit a couple of threes towards the end in, in the heart of trying to get up, but the heart that he showed, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, we were talking before air about the press conference afterwards and his words about how, how he just broke down crying about how, uh, how much he put into this game. Jerry McCain, it was very apparent what you put into this game, the work ethic that you brought to this team all year long. We have talked about it. We were thankful to have your parents on here to talk about uh, that aspect of how how your game has evolved and how they've been a part of that. We saw that last night. It was incredible to see you shoot a basketball <laughs> last night because it, for at times when it was, you know, Jason, there's points during the season and even last night where when he would jump up and he had the ball in his hands, he's about to shoot. Whoever I was with, we were all like, good, because we knew like you could tell just by him shoot, rising into the air that it was going to be a magical shot. And, and, and he did that time and time again. And even again, as we were struggling in offense, he seemed to be the bright star throughout the game. Yeah, look, he gets 32 or 64 points. If you can't do math, that's 50% of the points. Mm -hmm. Really impressive. He uh, he tied Zion Williamson for the most points ever scored by a Duke freshman in a tournament game, 32 points. I, I, I do want to, I mean, let's be clear, the stats a little bit, the stats on him are a little bit deceptive. Three of the four, um, three, three of his three-pointers that he hit were in the final minute, minute and 10 seconds or so. Yeah, like, the game was yeah, like two minutes of the game. Yeah, the game was really decided at that point. Um, uh, in fact, he had 15 points in the final three minutes when, again, it felt like the game was kind of already decided by then. Um, when it mattered earlier in the game, like everyone else, he 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 couldn't make the shots that we really wanted him to. But, man, he was ice at the free throw line, you know, just super impressive at that. And, uh, you know, Throughout much of the game, he was really the only guy on the team generating much offense offense for us. He, he by the way, was second on the team in rebounds in this game, which is, you know, yet another place where he was impressive statistically. And and I did want to mention that post-game press conference. So he, he's talking about, Jared starts talking about how at the beginning of the season, he struggled. You know, he, he did not come out of the gate, you know, I think the way he finished the season, <laughs> you know, certainly mm -hmm. not. And and he said it meant so much for, for the coaching staff, especially John Shire, and for everyone else to believe in him. And he said John Shire had instilled confidence in him. And it was reflecting on that. It was at that moment that Jared broke up and couldn't continue to speak. And you saw John Shire then, you know, put a hand on his shoulder and and comfort him. I, I can tell you that Jared McCain loves and cherishes his time at Duke thus far. And, and that he got a tremendous amount out of being coached and tutored by this entire coaching staff. Um, he's just a, he was a joy for all of us to get to watch. You know, NC State had DJ Burns, who is the guy who always had the smile on his face, who was a joy to watch. Duke had Jared McCain, who was the exact same way. And frankly, not every team has a guy like that. There are plenty mm -hmm. of seasons at Duke where I don't recall anybody who always had the smile on their face. Players like that, they they stay in your heart forever. And it's worth noting that Jared McCain was named to the All-South Region team, along with Kyle Filipowski. Those two guys were Duke's two representatives on the All-South Region team. Um, that's a little bit of hardware to stick in his case. Um, I, you know, it's such a pity. It's such a pity that that's how his freshman season has to end. I go back to the very beginning of the season. I mean, the very first official practice and I think we talked about this on the show where uh, they had the clips from the opening practice and they had an interaction with John Shire and Jared McCain and John called this, him yeah. over. Yeah. And he called him over and was like, look, look, man, you need to hunt for your shot sometimes. And I know you don't like to do that. I know that's not your style, but here we like, we brought you in because we know you have a good shot and we want you to, to hunt for that at times. He's like, obviously do it within the flow, but I just know that we have confidence that when you go up for a shot that we think is going in too. And I think starting that planting that seed in him in day one is what led to the Jared McCain we saw yesterday, right? In all season and in the work ethic that he did, where he had games where he shot, he had 28 points and he'd say he'd go and shoot 300 jumpers because he's like, oh, I missed three, three, three pointers. And you're like, yo, it's, it's like that's the type of work ethic that you you hope everyone would have. But Jason, I think also in in, in spite of the shooting woes that we all had, 
The one place where he also got it done was at the free throw line. It was 11 for 11 from the line. The only guy who did miss a free throw. So again, he took the, he, he was aggressive. He got to the line when he needed to and made those free throws, but also he was able to, you know, keep us in the ball game on a night where it felt like nothing was going in. Yeah. Well, and by the way, those free throws came, a lot of them came early when Mm -hmm. Duke was really struggling to score and, and they were just so, so important. And you couldn't leave a single point out there on that free throw line in a game like this, where, where it was going to be so difficult to get any points on the board. Yeah. I mean, Jared, I, I have very little negative to say about his game. Like I said, I, you know, what do, do I wish he'd been a little hotter earlier? Of course, but um, no, overall, a, a great game by him. A couple of guys I want to kind of put in a block, and Jason, you can take this block however you wish, is three guys that came off the bench, Ryan Young, Sean Stewart, and Jalen Blakes. Now, while I don't think they did, we'll talk about the offense because I think everyone on offense really didn't have the best night, but on defense and just like those intangibles of hustle, especially in the first half, Ryan Young, Sean Stewart, and Jalen Blakes were there. Uh, Ryan Young had four rebounds. Uh, Sean Stewart, two points, four rebounds, and two vicious blocks, including one that was initially called a goaltend, but they reviewed it and realized that, no, that man just went and grabbed it off, off the backboard. Uh, and then Jalen Blakes had three rebounds and assists and a steal. I, I, I love the heart that these guys showed, and I love the energy that they were able to uh, influence. And, and when you talk about guys like Ryan Young, again, Ryan Young had a, had a just a disastrous of a matchup. When we think about what he normally – is up against right an athletic guy but when he was up against dj burns he did his best to keep him front did he give up points yeah every it felt like everybody did but i felt like he was doing really good at keeping him in front of him and then sean stewart i think sean stewart presented a, a different element of his game that gives us hope that man like i'd love to see that continue to grow over the summer and into next year because it, he's not he's no longer just a one-dimensional athletic you know, player anymore. He has a lot of other things in his game. He's learned how to, you know, rebound very really well. He's he's learned to be in the right positions so that when he blocks, it's effortless. And it's not that he's, you know, risking health and safety to, you know, jump out of the gym. He's relying on more than just his athleticism. He's rounding out his game little by little. And I think uh, those flashes that we see um, are things that we can say, oh, man, Sean Stewart is going to be a problem if he stays and he's able to uh, work on it over the summer and really come into this team next year as one of the guys that has this experience. So uh, I, I, I'm really, I'm just on in, on an energy level. I think all those guys brought it, and especially in the first half, I thought they were a catalyst when our starters were in the game to keeping us, you know, again, six, seven points uh, ahead of NC State the entire time. Yeah, so I got I got plenty to say about Sean Stewart. I mean, like you said, eye popping, eye popping athletic plays. Um, and when he was in at the end after Flip had fouled out, it just I kept on going. I was like, why haven't we seen more of this guy? And look, I don't want to, I don't want to be too critical of John Shire. John Shire knows way more about basketball than I do. John Shire's watching these guys in practice when I'm not. But man. It really feels like Sean Stewart should have played more, not just in this game, but all season long. I'm just going to go ahead and say that. Um, I mean, his athleticism was a clear problem for DJ Burns. If if you look at it on paper, you would think, oh, DJ Burns is just going to back Sean Stewart down. You know, DJ Burns is a fifth year, whatever, senior. Sean Stewart's Mm -hmm. a a young freshman who doesn't have a lot of playing time. DJ Burns is going to own him. Uh, that, That wasn't the case. That wasn't the case, by the way, when we played in Raleigh a few weeks ago either. Sean Stewart's athleticism is a problem for the opposition. And in this game, he picks up four rebounds in 10 minutes. I read somewhere, I I haven't been able to confirm it. It's hard to find this exact stat. I read somewhere that Sean has the highest rebound rate per minute of anyone in college basketball who played more than 100 minutes this year. That's ridiculous. That's that's wild. That's crazy. I, I looked. By the way, on Ken Palm, when Sean was in the game for Duke, he grabbed almost 20% of offensive rebounds, and he grabbed almost 25% of defensive rebounds. I want to be clear. That's not just on the Duke team. That's of all the 10 players on the floor. Compare that to other guys on Duke, and you'll see. Like, he is a whole level beyond anyone else on this team in terms of his rebound rate. 
By the way, his block rate also led the team. I'm not surprising to hear that. And look, his, his block rate was, I, I checked, his block rate wasn't like Mark Williams or Derek Lively kind of block rate, but he's only mm -hmm. six nine. He's, he's not 7-1. <laughs> right. Um, and, and he wasn't necessarily in a position, like the Duke defense wasn't designed for him to get blocks the way it was when we funneled stuff to Mark Williams and Derek Lively. But Sean Stewart's stats, again, were just eye-popping. And, and he showed in this game, you know, it's one of these, one of the few games where he got decent minutes that he is going to impact the game. I know that he has butterfingers. I know that he gets lost. I know he's young and still learning. But my goodness, some of the stuff he can do on the floor, you can't duplicate in any other kind of way. And I, I, I love that we got a tantalizing peek at it against NC State, both in Raleigh and in this game. Um, I wish I'd had a little bit more of it this year and I'm praying, praying, praying. We get a lot more of it next year in a Duke uniform. I mean, next year, I know we're not going to talk about that for a while, but next year, it seems like, uh, he's, he's getting a couple new teammates in the volleyball department, right? Like they they could, yeah. they could, they could play a lot of volleyball next year on defense if they want to, uh, <laughs> exactly. that's what it feels yeah. like. Uh, but I digress. I, I, yeah, I, I think with, with Sean Stewart, everything you said is correct. And, and I think honestly, like, you know, his, we, we talked about this, right? Early in the season, the game had not slowed down for him. And we saw as the year went on that it did. It started to slow down slowly but surely. And that's where you saw him gain more confidence when he was on the floor. It wasn't like he was running around, you know, just looking for the next thing to, to, to send into the Raptors. He was working within the flow of the offense. And on defense, he was in position to make plays not just by, you know, athleticism, but also by footwork and technique. I think that improved as the year goes along. And that's why we're so when we look at the Sean Stewart today versus the Sean Stewart on September 27th or whatever, when, when practice started, this is, this is a much different player. He is no longer a freshman. He is a, he is a sophomore by nature uh, and by how he plays. So uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to seeing hopefully him uh, back next year, Jason, I go back to you. What is there anything else to the good? Because I want to really focus in on the defense in the first half. Because I thought we played excellent defense in the first half, and despite our offensive struggles, you know some of the guys that have killed us in the past when we play NC State, like Muhammad Diara and uh, Casey Morso, were kind of held at bay for most of the game. Yeah, uh, look, uh, the first half was a weird half to watch. Yes, absolutely. Uh, both teams were playing good defense, but both teams were also just missing a lot of shots and and just look disjointed. I think the moment Duke is young, NC State is old, didn't matter. No one in that game, other than Jeremy Roach, had played in a Elite Eight game before. And and, and I'm you know you, know, you can make oh Sweet Sixteen round of you know Final Four whatever. Elite Eight is a little bit special. Everyone knows the Final Four is a big old deal. Making the final, you know, you hang a banner for making the Final Four. So it's <laughs> it's something that's going to throw guys off mentally, mm -hmm. the opportunity to get there. And and I think in that first half you saw a pretty good bit of that. I've I've never I've frankly never seen Duke be as disjointed as we were on offense, and I feel like State was probably a little bit of the same. Again, both teams were playing really, really good defense. But I think a lot of what was going on was that both teams just sort of, they couldn't figure out what could make them comfortable. They couldn't figure out what would what would succeed. And the game was really a race to see who's going to figure that out first. And unfortunately, in the second half, we know who got that answer. Yeah. I, I John Shire used the word disjointed at halftime in his uh, halftime interview with uh, uh, Tracy Wilson. Um, and I don't think I've heard anyone else use another way to describe that first half uh, than disjointed. You said it, I said it like it, it seems like that was the the theme yeah. of, of this game. And, and it, again, unfortunate that it is in an elite eight, but sometimes that's the way uh, the ball rolls off the rim. Jason, anything else before we wrap up the good? No, that, I mean, I, I, I wish we could talk for longer about the good, but I, yeah. I don't have, I mean, Maybe a little. I got some stuff to say about Kyle Filipowski that isn't all bad, but I think we should probably save it for the bad. All right. Well, let's take a quick break here. On the other side, we'll get to all the stuff that is the reason why we're talking today about the end of the Duke season. Stick with us. Duke. 
This episode of the DBR is brought to you by BetterHelp. Hey, everybody. This is Jason Evans of the Duke Basketball Roundup podcast. You know, the truth is I'd be lying if I told you I didn't have stuff to work on <laughs> all my life. I've had a great passion for the things that I wanted to do, like this podcast, but not as much for the things that I was supposed to do. And honestly, it used to get me in trouble sometimes. But some years ago, I started talking about it with a therapist, and and it really helped. And I learned to embrace the supposed to, not just the want to. And frankly, my life is better for it. If you don't believe me, just ask my wife. Getting advice from people who know how to listen is what better help is all about. It is therapy for the internet era, completely online, making it convenient and flexible to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched to a professional licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time. So visit betterhelp.com slash Duke Roundup today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Duke Roundup. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Okay, I'm going to turn that recording on. All right, Jason, we are back and we are headed to the portion that we don't like. And, and unfortunately, there's quite a bit of stuff that we need to talk about this game that did not go well. And Jason, I'm just going to start with this. We shot 32% from the floor, not from three, from the floor. We shot 25% from three point land. And again, all of those five threes that were made were hit by Jared McCain. As a team, we just could not hit water from a boat. And you mentioned in the first part, that shots were landing short where we gassed from the energy expended from the Houston game. It felt fairly clear that that was probably a factor uh, in that, but man, it just felt like every, like no matter what we could do, it just felt like we just could not hit anything. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Duke hit 35% from two and 25% from three. Uh, uh-uh. those numbers are actually inflated when the game mattered. Because Duke went on a little bit of a run late. When the game mattered, when the game was still on the line, Duke was hitting roughly 25% from the floor and about 12% mm-hmm. from three. Uh, look, it's real simple. We could, we could stop the podcast right now. 25% of the floor, 12%. You're not winning a game like that. Not winning. Yeah. You simply cannot win in a game like that. I, I agree with you. I think that I think there were a lot of tired legs out there. Um, I mean, it, State played Marquette. It was the game. It was the early game. Duke had the late game. Am I right about that? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that's correct. They had the early game. We had the late game. So they played Marquette. It was a relatively easy game for them. Marquette had a sort of like Duke did. Marquette just could not shoot, couldn't hit anything. And and it was one of these games where even though you might play the full 40 minutes, it it didn't feel like you were working that hard. Like if mm-hmm. you're NC State, you, you were in relaxation mode for most of that second half. And and that's just, you know. There's a mental toll the games take on you in addition to a physical toll. And and State had a very easy mental time against Marquette, while Duke had an absolute physical and mental war against Houston. And yeah, I mean, playing the game 36, 38 or so hours later definitely definitely had an impact on on Duke. Um, I mean, there's I, I, I'm gonna say it had to be the tired legs because there's almost no other explanation that makes sense to me. Like the Mm -hmm. number of shots we missed both close and from three, I was just like, it's uh, like I said, Marquette had an out of body experience. Duke had an out of a body experience. I don't don't know what witchcraft NC state is using, what voodoo magic they're performing, but uh, both their sweet 16 and their elite eight opponents had like literally one of their worst days of the entire year um, when it came to shooting the basketball. Yeah, I mean, Tyrese Proctor, zero for nine from the field. That's that's like, net, that doesn't happen, right? Like those sort of things don't happen. The number of shots that fell short, like it just, it just, and it was expounded upon because we had a couple of possessions where we got a couple of shots off and we got a rebound. We passed back out short again, get a rebound, pass back out short again. And it just felt like on those, again, momentum's a mother when it comes to the NCAA tournament. You can get it quickly. You can lose it quickly. And when NC State got the momentum in the second half, that was it. It just felt like a like just like a, a mudslide uh, on top of you, and you just couldn't do anything. 
about it. Yeah, and, and regarding Tyrese Proctor, who you just mentioned, he had been on a roll. Like Tyrese right. had hit multiple threes in eight of Duke's previous ten games, multiple three, and like routinely hitting three and four three pointers. Three and four, yeah, yeah. We talked about how good we are when he hits three threes, like thirteen and yeah. one. Yeah, but Owen zero for nine in this game, zero for five from three, and toward the end of the game, I want to say it was like maybe four or five minutes left when it still felt like Duke had a chance to come back. He had like a little five footer in the lane. He was largely unguarded. And he missed that, and I was just like, "Why?" You know, that's that's the moment I, I was like, "Okay, I," you know, like what? Yeah, what did he do? He didn't do anything wrong to deserve that. Like, what? what, what exactly? Who did? Who did he? Who did he piss off? Like to make that happen? Because that that was, it almost felt like it, it was like someone else controlling the basketball, and it was like remote control operated. And as soon as it yeah. get to the rim, they like Boop, and just like like send it wide or send it off the top of the rim. It, it was just unfathomable. And, and Jason, I think, coupled with that is the defense in the second half. It, NC State shot 73%. They woke up in a big way, and we just, again, we couldn't stop the DJs, Burns or Horn, like just could not stop them at all. I will say in the, uh, when you look at the Ken Palm, you know how he breaks it down by quarters, essentially. Yeah. The first 10 minutes of the second half, we were outscored 21 to 11. In the last 10 minutes, we were outscored 34 to 26. And again, as you mentioned, a lot of that 26 was in the last like two or three minutes of the basketball game when we were just like at a certain point was like, oh, we'll just if we just shoot and it goes in, then whatever, right? But man, it just felt like once they took the lead, we're like, okay, it's a close game. We can get back into this. We just got to start hitting some shots. And it just never did, but they just never stopped missing. I think that was the problem. Uh, look, they scored, I, I think the number was 56, 55, 55 points. Mm -hmm. In the second half. Uh, I don't need to go back that far to remember. So Duke allowed 51 points to Houston, 47 points to Vermont, and 50 55 points. to JMU. Yeah. Was in it a game. Yeah. In the entire game. Basically, in the second half, NC State had an entire game worth of offense for Duke's other opponents. I mean, come on. And I feel like Duke never adjusted at all. And especially I'm talking about DJ Burns. He mm -hmm. got super comfortable in this game. He knew there were no double teams coming. He knew exactly what kind of defense we we're going to throw at him in terms of the type of player that was going to guard him. We needed to show him something different. We need to give him different looks. We need to make him not comfortable. I mean, anyone who's played the game of basketball will tell you that when you start to get comfortable, you're, you're going to be like 10 times as effective. And, as a team, and again, I'm I'm not I don't want to put too much of this on John Shire, but I think we needed as a team and as a coaching staff to say, okay, you know what? We're trying something against DJ Burns. He is way too comfortable right now. We got to do something to throw him off a little tiny bit. And I think one of the reasons that DJ Burns struggled a little bit when we put Sean Stewart in on him was that that was something different. The Uber athlete was something he hadn't faced when he's being guarded by Flip or Ryan Young, or even Mark Mitchell for that matter. And and so that may have thrown DJ Burns off at least a little tiny bit for that brief moment. But Duke just had to find a way to adjust and make State not comfortable because State was, I mean, wow, 55 points comfortable in that second half. I mean, even if Duke had shot a reasonable percentage, I'm not sure we keep up with them. I think that's the, yeah, the, the defense. And again, it, you want to throw a different look at him. I, I joked during the game when DJ Burns went up, uh, it was kind of not necessarily in a fast, it was, I guess it was a fast break. He jumps up on, uh, and Sean Stewart jumps up to try and defend, but he jumps straight up. And so he jumps into Sean Stewart, lays it in and, and hits the ground and they call an and one. And I joked that that's a flop because there's no way that Sean Stewart's knocking DJ Burns to the ground. Like there's just like the fact that he hit the ground should tell you that that was not a foul that should be uh, a flop going the other way. And it was because that was the only thing that stopped him. The only thing that stopped him was the, was the ground. Like he, he was everywhere and it felt like all he had to do is just back down to within the four, uh, four uh, yard circle, a four meter circle. And once he was inside there, he knew that his defender couldn't do anything, but watch him just lay it in every single time. It was, 
credit to NC State because they just kept going to it. And credit to DJ Burns for making those shots because, again, you know, there's times where when they were, you know, not doing well during the season, it's because he was getting to his spots, but he wasn't making those shots. But even when he was missing some, in comes DJ Horn, and he, DJ Horn went off in the second half as well. I think both of them combined outscored Duke in the second half. So once yeah, you, if you don't have surprised. an answer, yeah, if you don't answer for those two, then that's it. It felt like the rest of the team for NC State, we kept them largely uh, at bay. You know, like, like I said, Mohamed Yari only had three points, and you know there was times where they were missing free throws, and we're like, okay, great, there's opportunities here to get back in the ball game, but it doesn't help when you're not making shots and it doesn't help when you're letting a team shoot 73% from the floor. It just, those are the, those are two things that just can't happen. And, and unfortunately this has happened in the past, right? We've had some, we've had some uh, exits from the NCAA tournament because one, one player has a, just a half where they just can't miss anything. Or we have a half where we, the, the lid is put on the jar and we can't hit anything. We just got both in this game. Yeah. And look, by, by the way, going back to the shooting, um, we already talked about Tyrese Proctor. I wanted to mention Jeremy Roach, um, who, who did have some nice forays, some nice drives into the lane to the basket, but overall was just five for 13 in this game. I strongly suspect, I strongly suspect that that the nagging injuries combined with the, the sprained finger that he got the other day against Houston did not allow him to shoot the way he's normally able to. He only attempted one three-pointer in this game. And in the month of March... Jeremy Roach was just seven of 28 on threes. That's just 25%. Um, he had been close to 50% the rest of the season. And, and it was like down the stretch, you know, his body kind of started to break down a little bit on him. And, and Jeremy just wasn't the player he had been earlier in the year. Gutsy though. I mean, like those, those four A's into the lane. And he was the only guy on Duke who could really do that the way he was doing it. His, his attempts to get to the bucket you know, he's brave. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, again, it's it, it's a pity it didn't work out for him more than it did. Five of 13, though, is is a problem. I will say early in the game, he got swatted across the face by DJ Burns on a drive. And he had to remember, he had to exit the game for a couple of minutes because he I mean, he had to kind of clear the cobwebs, so to speak, before he checked back in. I think that also played a factor because he got raked across the eyes and once you, you know, as everybody knows, if you scratch your eye or whatever, you can still probably see and get back in the game. But one thing that has affected is depth perception. And I think, again, some of those shots that he had were uncharacteristically short for him. And it not, I don't think it was all just the nagging injuries and running out of gas from Houston. I, I, I do think for him, especially close to the rim when he was doing a lot of those, he was missing a lot of, uh, of short shots because of the fact that I think that affected him throughout the game, at least in some part. Look, you mentioned him getting hit in the face by DJ Burns. It's worth noting that, that no foul was called on that play. And mm -hmm. I did not want to come on here. I, I, I'm not sure I haven't timed it. I think we're a good 30 plus minutes into this episode. I did not yeah. want to come on here and blame the refs off the start. But I'm going to tell you right now, the refs sucked in that game. I almost used an expletive there. I decided not to at the last <laughs> moment. They were terrible. State repeatedly hacks Duke guys on the arms. They were bumping into dudes. Frankly, DJ Burns was committing fouls left and right, especially offensive fouls. And the refs didn't dream of blowing that whistle. And I just saw it, it, it right after the Houston game where the same kind of thing happened. I don't understand. Maybe I'm just a fair weathered fan. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I just wear Duke colored glasses too much, but it just feels to me like every damn game Duke is getting mauled left and right. Our guys are getting hit on the arms as they're trying to grab rebounds and things like that. And the refs swallow their whistles again and again and again. And look, I know Duke shot a pretty fair number of free throws in this game. I still feel we could have shot twice as many free throws and it probably wouldn't have been fair. I don't understand why the referees can't call the game the same way at both ends. By the way, Ben Middlebrooks, how did that guy not foul out of the game? That right. dude did nothing but but bump into dudes, grab guys' arms and stuff. There was one point where they, I forget all the circumstances of, they started looking at it like they're going to call maybe a flagrant on someone from Duke. I forget who it was. Oh, oh I, I remember it was the play with Mark Mitchell, with mm -hmm. Ben Middlebrooks. They ended up calling it a common foul. He said, no, it was nothing. I was like, 
Did you guys not even notice Ben Middlebrooks just trucked Jared McCain? Absolutely. He tripped him. Yeah, he tripped so, him. Yeah, and someone... then trucked and then trucked uh, into uh, into Mitchell, and that's why Mitchell kind of like to yeah. steady himself because he was going for rebound went like you know kind of pushed his arm out, and then they look at the Mitchell arm, and I'm like, yo, he tripped Jared McCain, which is why Jared McCain wasn't involved in the rebound. I, I heard, I, I Jason, yeah. I heard tripping is a thing that we're supposed to be looking at in the NCAA. Yeah. Uh, by the way, a friend of mine texted me at that moment. He's like, what are they looking at? You know, what's the debate right now? I said, I said, oh, Ben Middlebrooks just just wiped out Jared McCain. So they're checking to see if Mark Mitchell committed a foul. Like, what the, uh, what, what, is, what was even happening there? And it, and that wasn't an isolated incident. Let me just put it that way. It happened all the time. It's incredibly frustrating. Uh, I, I think part of it is. Duke is younger and more skilled and more talented. Look, our roster is full of guys who are going to be playing in the NBA. And a lot of these other teams that we play are older, more experienced guys who have to play more physical. If, if you try and play a skill game against Duke, you're going to lose. Literally every other team in the country, maybe Kentucky, every other team in the country, you play a skill game against Duke, you're going down. So you have to play physical against Duke. That's your only chance when you've got a roster full of 24, 25, 26-year-old guys who have no hopes of playing in the Turkish League. So if you're NC State, let's play physical and dare the refs. If you're Houston, let's play physical and dare the refs. And the refs did not, were not up to the challenge. I think, you know, a lot of the, like, fouls that I think should have been called were, you know, when balls were going out of bounds and they were, you know, people re reaching for the ball or whatever. We get slapped. The ball goes off of us, and it goes out of bounds. And all you're doing is yelling TV. Yes, it went off of us, but that's because he was fouled in the process. He's his hand was slapped, and that's why the guy didn't get the ball. He yes, he didn't touch the ball because he he fouled. He hacked the guy's arm, and now we can, now we don't get the ball, and we don't get the foul. I think the issue with it, and we can leave it after this. I think the issue with the refs is that they in a physical game. I get it's hard to call, but also. They are human too. And they hear the arena where there's 97% of the people in the arena rooting against Duke, booing every call against the other team. They hear that too. They see the people who are like the Duke gets all the call stuff. And there's a lot of pressure on them to not make those calls, especially 50 50 calls where you can kind of get away with it. And I'm not saying there's some overlying conspiracy, but I'm just saying that they're human and, hu and humans can get caught up in human things. And the human element of everybody in the gym really wanting to see this upset happen every single year, every single game. Some referees, unfortunately, respond to that uh, in by giving some calls, some some home cooking, right? In, in a sense, except in this case, it's the lead eight, and we're in, we're both in Dallas. But I, I I don't think the referees were as bad as the Houston game. If that makes sense. But I do think that there were some calls that left me wondering, yo. What's really going on here? Um, because I see what's going on. I see the foul. I'm not sure why they aren't as well because they're on the court and, and I'm at home. But, okay, end of the rough part. Jason, anything else you have uh, in the bed? Yeah, so I've, I've got to go to our big men just very briefly. Um, Kyle Filipowski is just three of 12 in this game. Um, he missed all his three-pointers. He was three of nine on two-point field goals. Uh, I, I looked – Kyle was three of eight on shots essentially in the lane within like, you know, three or four feet of the basket. Um, I noticed that when he posted up, when he would stick his butt out, when he was back to the basket and we would get him the ball in the post in that way, he was very effective. When he would come from the perimeter and back his man down or, or you know, take the ball in the lane off the dribble, he was less effective. You, you, a guy like Kyle Filipowski with his size and with his skill, you, you got to be better than three of eight on shots within five feet. You, you've just got to. And, it, you know, I'm not calling him out more than anybody else because the entire rest of the team was missing all those shots. But, man, it was really rough for, for Kyle to miss those shots in as close as he was. Uh, and then uh, Mark Mitchell, two of three, you know, just wasn't wasn't involved in it. It's like we we mentioned, you know, Mark Mitchell gets up, gets down, gets up, gets down. Um, he he was down, frankly, you know, in the NCAA tournament. Uh, this wasn't the Mark Mitchell that we. Uh, he was good against Vermont, I should say. He was very good against Vermont, mm -hmm. but 
two points against James Madison, two points against Houston, six points in this game. His usage percentages were incredibly low. Like he just wasn't getting the ball, wasn't finishing plays, wasn't even trying to finish plays. Like he literally wasn't part of the Duke offense. And what that allowed to happen was DJ Burns was guarding Mark Mitchell on defense. And DJ Burns got to play 50% of the game. And by that, I mean, he played hard on offense and then he went down on defense and he stood there in the lane as a one man zone and didn't do much of anything. And there were a couple times Mark tried to attack from the perimeter a little bit. Didn't really work out every time. You know, he usually he would end up, they, the help would come and he would pass it off and then a guy would miss a shot. But we've just, you know, we had to find a way to make DJ Burns work harder on defense. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Does it mean that we that we need to bring in a TJ Power or or find some way to, you know, to play maybe more guys out on the perimeter, guys who can actually hit the shot? I, I don't know what the answer necessarily was, but we allowed DJ Burns, who's a player who doesn't want to play defense, who who is not able to exert a lot of effort. We allowed him to play only half the game when he was on the floor. And as a result, he was able to work even harder on offense. That that was a big key. That that's not an obvious key to the game, but to me, that was a big key to the game. And some of that has to fall on Mark Mitchell, who was the guy that DJ Burns was able to relax on defense against. Yeah, and and part of you know the thing is if you get DJ Burns tired, it takes him out of his game. And yeah, sure, he's not going to be able to do do the thing where he's just backing down into the forfeit circle and, and lay it in every single time. He wouldn't have uh, the juice to to do that sustained for a full game because he's exerting energy on both ends of the floor. I think we we played into his hands by allowing him to rest on defense, and that way he's able to use all of his energy on offense. And even if you remember, Jason, at times they would bring him in on offense, and then they you know if there was a foul or a timeout or some sort on the floor, they'd bring in Dr on defense and go back to that. So uh, it, it's very interesting um, that that led to. Uh, Unfortunately, us being eliminated. Jason, I think we can end it here with the bad. Let's go to our play of the game. Which one did you have? Uh, so I don't remember which one it was. One of the two blocks by Sean Stewart uh, is my play of the game. I think it was the one that they didn't call goaltending. Oh, that they called mm -hmm. goaltending at first, then they then they reversed it. Uh, yeah. I just recall watching that play and saying to myself, well, things are going awful. And that was unbelievable. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and make that my play of the game. Uh, really, really. I mean, like his ability to elevate quickly is special. Just absolutely mm -hmm. special. And frankly, there wasn't a lot else in this game that I saw from Duke. that I'm like, that was a great play. So I'll take the block by Sean Stewart. It was vicious, too. Um, my play of the game was a little bit earlier in the game. It was actually, uh, we just talked about Mark Mitchell and Cal Filipowski. It was a flip pass to Mark Mitchell for a layup to put us up 21 14. The first thing about it was uh, I, we were joking at, at, at my best friend's house. I, I think it's the first layup that I've seen Mark Mitchell do all year. It's either been dunks or nothing, right? Like, and we've talked about kind of his, his tendency to finish at the rim. Uh, if it, if it's a layup, he usually gets blocked. That was when he laid it off the glass and they immediately called timeout after that. And I thought, we were on the verge of breaking the game wide open. We had been in the discussion. I think we talked about this in the preview where it felt like throughout this whole run that NC state had, they have had a uh, tendency to get maybe six, seven points uh, deficit and then catch back up. And then we were like, Oh man, if we could just get a couple more baskets and like maybe go up 10 or 11 points, then maybe they could kind of feel like this is the end and that our run is coming and we can just, you know, really pour it on from there. And it just didn't happen. But I thought at that play, at that moment when we called timeout, that was a very pivotal moment that we could have used uh, to really go on a run. It just didn't feel like it was. It just never happened. Uh, and that was the unfortunate thing. Jason, yeah, I mean, that, that whole oh, yeah. Donald, that whole first half was you kept on feeling like Duke was about to Duke's about to stretch. Duke's yep. about to stretch. NC State's about to feel real pressure. And it never quite happened. And like I, I think the announcers, the the uh, the halftime guys talked about it a little bit. They're like, NC State's kind of lucky to be as close as it is right now. And I was like, Yeah, I I totally agree. And when State started turning it on in the second half, you were like, God, we should have been leading this game by 15 points at halftime. Right, should have made it a little bit harder for them to make that make that run and catch up. Uh, let's do Player of the Week. It's our last game of the week. Obviously, last game of the season. Uh, who do you got for Player of the Week? I, there's a couple. It's weird. There's a lot of 
guys that played well in yeah. one game and not the other. Yeah, I came close to taking flip, um, uh, but I, I I ended up going with Jared McCain. Uh, he, you look, McCain wasn't great against Houston, but played all 40 minutes against them. And their defense had to really key on him a lot because they were so concerned about it. Um, he had a, yeah, he had a decent, yeah. Okay. Game against Houston. Um, had a lot of assists four assists against Houston, but then obviously he was, he scored half of Duke's points against NC state 32 points uh, to me that that's enough. I got Jared McCain as my player of the week. I'm glad you mentioned Jared McCain because I was going to pick him if you didn't. So you picking him allows me to pick Ryan Young because I think Ryan Young, his, his... he was in the running for me. Believe me. Yeah. 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 Just the fact that you, the, the, sh- the warrior shift that he put on against Houston, uh, I thought really helped us. And as we talked about, he was probably the MVP of that game, even though he, he didn't have to score 30 points to it. He did so much in so many other ways. And again, I think the defensive portion of things, uh, against NC State, he was there. He was active. He provided the energy. He he is a guy. I I think he's the you know he's the only guy uh, on this team that we know cannot come back next year. Uh, he yeah. is the only guy that has run out of eligibility. So Ryan Young, salute to you. Thank you for the two years that you gave us uh, in a Duke uniform. You uh, enjoy the, enjoy the rest of business school and the rest uh, of where life takes you. Uh, you were forever a Blue Devil to us. You you have been you have been amazing uh, to be be on this team. Hey, uh, Donald. Last thing I wanted to do, just very quickly, we got an email from uh, Wilco from the DPR mm-hmm. boards, uh, Will C- uh, Countess, um, and he said he pointed this out. I thought this was really interesting. He said, you know, sometime after the 1986 title loss a game which for people, you know, I started off as saying people ask how you're doing. I was not doing well after we lost stung. 86. You were, you were probably stung. Yes, man. That was low moment for me. But he said after the 86 title loss, coach K said something like, I don't know how I didn't know how to help my team. I hadn't been in that situation before. I need to learn from it. And what Wilco said was, I hope this becomes that kind of moment for John Shire where he learns how to be better in certain situations, managing game pressure, perhaps keeping guys fresh, throwing a curveball to the other team to keep them off balance. I thought that's that's a great take on what happened this season and what we saw. We are so excited about John Shire and the job he is doing at Duke, making an Elite Eight in his second year as a head coach. But the reality is it's just his second year as a head coach. Things are going to happen that he's just not quite prepared for. As much time as he spent next to Coach K, it's different when you're the guy making the decisions. It's different when your voice is the one that everyone is looking toward. He is still super young and super inexperienced. And he is still learning. And that's what Wilco is pointing out there. And I think that is really important to remember. And I, I, I expect based on what I know of John Shire, based on what I've seen of John Shire, that he will take situations like this game against NC State, where I think most people would say, what in his best coaching hour? And he will learn from it, and he will grow from it, and he will do his damnedest to make sure it never happens again. Hey, look, we already saw it this year, right? After that Tennessee game, and we're like, hey, there was a lot of a lot of question marks about this team and what how we replace a lot of people and how we continue to get back to that level. And even, you know, three weeks ago, people were like, well, what's going to happen to John Shire? Should he be on the hot seat if we don't get out of the first weekend? He took us to the Elite Eight in the second year. And again, as you mentioned, Jason, I'm going to repeat it. It was his second year as a head coach. He is only going to get better. Uh, AI technology gets better as you as you use it. And as John Shire becomes older, he's going to become, you know, just <laughs> have all these experiences and he gets to follow them away. He's going to be able to use this next year. And I will note, Jason, uh, I couldn't help but note, that next year's final four is in San Antonio. My final game as a college kid was in San Antonio in that 2004 final four. I have some demons to exercise next year and I'm looking forward to doing so. Uh, and, and hopefully John Shire and the boys will be able to give us another year that ends very, very deep into the calendar uh, of, of 2025. Yeah. Uh, San Antonio, by the way, beautiful, beautiful city. That, that river walk there is like, Fabulous. I love San Antonio. I just so. went back for the in, in January for a soccer match. It was the first time I had been back since 2004. So now, you know, I can go back and now be like, all right, it's time to exercise some demons. It, it, everyone, 
I hope everyone has fun with college basketball for the next six, seven months because scary hours are coming and we're going to be ready for it. We're going to leave it here again. We're going to have more this week. We're going to have. Yeah, uh, we. I was going to say we should mention to folks uh, that that was a recap of the final game, but not of the season. Yes. We got our season recap, the recap of the stats game coming up this week. And Sam will be back with us. Sam will be back to recap everything on the stats game and see who won that. I, I, it's going to be close. There's a lot of categories where we we probably, did, frankly, just didn't get it right. Uh, but that's fine. <laughs> that's what the stats game's for. It's for us to to poke fun at ourselves uh, over our whole podcast uh, after the year is over. And also, of course, there is going to be news. I, I expect uh, that news is going to come pretty quickly uh, about some of these players on the team and their futures. Uh, at whether they decide to stay, go, transfer, whatever that may be, we will be here to cover it all and, and recap uh, all of those decisions and, and, and analyze how it's going to affect the Duke team moving forward. But until then, he is Jason Evans. I am Donald Wine. This has been episode number 619. Thank you, as always, for listening. Thank you for following us all year. The season may be done, but the offseason begins, and we will be here every step of the way. So continue to stay tuned to us. And now it is time for the Duke Band. Play us out and take us home.